let's uh, welcome our panelists. So first we have uh, Dinesh from Intel, who was the keynote speaker. Please give him a warm welcome. He <laughs> he's replacing uh, actually Guillaume from Key Factor, who was stuck in the storm in France. No trains, no flights, unfortunately. But I have notes from Guillaume, uh, and uh, he makes some rather interesting um, observations that I'll share with you. Then the next panelist is Nikita from NXP. Please welcome him. And let's get this started. So, uh, as I mentioned, this panel will be different. Usually you have a discussion panel where you have a group of people talking just to each other and telling you how, yeah, there's a problem, but we have a solution, right? They pitch you a solution. Well, in this case, I've asked um, our colleagues here to be a bit more critical and also share their personal professional thoughts on what does not work. And I think one of the things is that, uh, as we saw even earlier, I think uh, Sergey was showing a smart speaker that, other than it was Linux, it had... Uh, so many processes with root privileges, it was just software-based security, which it's not no longer good enough. So what are your thoughts about that? Why, why the adoption of hardware security is low in embedded devices, IoT devices, edge systems? And this, this translates to infrastructure. This translates to hospitals, to smart city infrastructure, intersections, traffic control, and so on. Um, I think the primary reason is cost, okay. right? So when you think about IoT devices, uh, even though it may be used in critical infrastructure in many different situations and all, um, you know, the cost becomes an overriding concern. And so when you think about adding on things that may be considered as a cost, and, and certainly TPMs and any other sort of root of trust are considered to be a hardware version of it is considered as, uh, you know, cost prohibitive. And, and so that, that's that been my experience, one of the things. Of course, there are alternatives to that that have come about, but, uh, you know, I've seen cost to be a predominant reason as well. And, and just be before, I want to quote Guillaume, who is not here, but he sent me a, like a three-page email with his thoughts, and uh, they're great. So what he says they're seeing at Key Factor, a PKI provider, is that in the past two years, the change, or what did not work, was that companies were not willing to spend for external secure elements on their devices and so on, which made it difficult to provide digital identities that can be secure. So uh, to you, Nikita, just... Oh, I completely agree with the cost factor. So it's definitely a major one, and the security is seen as a cost today by almost uh, anyone. And so if you say, okay, we have the budget and we need to cut somewhere, uh, is it a feature that the user wants? No? Okay, fine. It can go to the garbage bin. And uh, typically security will be one of the first ones. And then there is a, a couple of others. Maybe they have a slightly different role in different markets, uh, in different products, but definitely backward compatibility. If you have stuff that works and you want to add security on top and it breaks it, we don't want it, right? That's what a lot of people would say to you. And if I can add to that a fun story that uh, I was just reminded to at lunch, talking to a researcher. Um, so two years ago, um, uh, one of the famous super supercar manufacturers reached out to my company, and we learned that they're using still TPM 1.2. If you know what the trusted platform module is, TPM 1.2 is deprecated. It's considered deprecated. But this is system exists. It's being used for provisioning. And they've kept using it on one side because of knowledge barrier, on the other side because of cost. And the craziest part when we get to embed it is that TPM as one solution is actually quite expensive for edge and IoT systems. So here I come to an example of Microsoft Pluton, which will come later where Microsoft even tried to get into the space and failed. They actually canceled the project. And I know NXP has something new also, which is the edge log solution about embedded on HSM. So are you hopeful about that, that this will change what does not work, high cost of security for IoT and edge systems? Actually kind of hopeful because <clears throat> I want to add first uh, one thing, but it comes actually nicely with the edge log idea. Uh, there is a yet another problem uh, or reason, if you want, uh, why people are not adding security, it's hard. It's like really difficult. You need to hire super experts, you know, 
who know what's a hash function and a encryption and whatnot, and who know how to use all this stuff, not just what it is, but also like how do you use it. And uh, worse than that, not how you use it, not how to implement it in a correct way. It's even even more complicated, you know. So, and uh, back to your uh, comment on edge lock. Yeah, this is something. A uh, small note of advertisement about our company, right? Um, it's a, it's a, this idea of having a, a tiny secure element which is inside of your chip already. It's not an external thing, you know, uh, which can actually reduce costs a little bit. It's not like you have to buy this chip for your main stuff and also a secure chip which uh, I don't know what it does, you know. Like if you are a salesperson or someone who is from, uh, you know, a, Hmm. deciding what features go in and out and what we can cut to reduce costs. Maybe you're like, well, I don't know what this thing does, so probably not necessary. Uh, but this idea of having kind of both in the same module, uh, it reduces the size, which is very nice for a lot of IoT uh, applications. Also for the PCB. <laughs> uh, exactly, yes. And uh, um, you create both uh, in kind of one box, you know, uh, magical box which does computations and does it securely. Uh, great. Mm, it's uh, small, so uh, it also reduces the back and forth time from the main CPU to the secure enclave, right, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, that, that's the idea. The idea is to bring more security, maybe reduce a little bit costs, and also kind of make it, or try to make it slightly easier to use. And before passing yeah. it to Dinesh, because I see he wants to say something. I feel like a lot of companies, large silicon vendors, and not only automakers, are going for the Apple experience. It's a closed system. It's a closed security system. But essentially, you're making the guarantees. You're saying, hey, we are an MCU vendor, SOC vendor. Here's a security solution that's built in. We vouch for it. We provide you the SDK or the API or whatever, and we cut you the cost. But you need to trust us even more than just purchasing a general SOC. And that's what Apple has done successfully, if you think about it. So uh, moving from the Apple T2 chip, which is a TPM-like solution, putting it inside the M1, now M2, and we have... Actually, there is a lot of research uh, went into how that is more secure against many in the middle attacks because there's no physical bus and so on. But of course, uh, it, it opens other possibilities for side channel attacks and so on. So, Dinesh, to you, because you're from Intel and Intel is also famous for building in security. And, um, yeah, I, I want to hear your take on this because you've been in the, in the industry longer than us. So you've seen trends. No, I think um, a couple of points. One is, uh, like Nikita said, uh, the usability and the complexity of these kind of technologies is a huge burden. Uh, so, you know, I remember one of our CISOs used to say, um, some of these technologies require a PhD to be able to make use of it in an enterprise environment. Um, you know, regular engineers and uh, non-techies can certainly cannot do that. So that was one point about the complexity. Back to um, your question, uh, Dimitri. So, yeah, I think... Um, our experience has been that you need to provide a range of solutions, um, right? So whether it's a discrete, uh, in the case of TPM, for example, going for the discrete for certain applications, integrated for another application for the reasons that you mentioned about the cost and ease of adoption and things like that. And then for those that, uh, you know, those uh, hardware versions are completely cost prohibitive, also providing a firmware-based alternative that's still better than uh, software, but, you know, the firmware-based uh, alternatives like FTPM and all do provide some level of guarantee for certain levels of applications. And th from a cost standpoint, it's a much more manageable situation. So my recommendation, usually when we have this kind of conversations about secured word of trust and all, is at least go for a privileged uh, firmware versions that's out there. Um, you know, the software versions, you might as well not have anything at all because it's a false sense of security from that standpoint. Very well said. Yeah. Um, th this kind of leads us uh, to, to the next topic, um, which is, okay, the new solutions. We've mentioned EdgeLock as one. It is available in external form, external chip, and also built in, in the new uh, SOCs. Um, again, um, the one thing that um, I, I'm going to be a bit critical about the uh, NE05, for example, uh, it, it actually emulates a TPM-like interface. Uh, with a kind of a Java applet or something like that, with a, with a smart card applet, 
uh, there is a lot in there. So I feel like if we're talking about security in general, it's exactly not having complexity. And, and we see that all these systems, they actually add complexity. So the next thing that comes to mind is, um, machine learning and AI. And this will be just a bit. I know everyone talks about this, but we have a keynote speaker who is profi- quite <laughs> professional about it. So I just want to mention that, um, how that is going to change the landscape. And is this going to provide us with more working solutions or with more let's say, knowledge barrier, if you will. Oh, actually, I have a couple of things to say. Uh, <laughs> yes. Maybe maybe even on things that you haven't mentioned at the, in your talk. So you said that you have this security for machine learning and then use machine learning to increase or decrease security, right? And actually, I worked quite a lot in the, the, the second domain. You know, like you have a machine learning, let's say, to recognize uh, traffic signs. You have a fancy car, right? It can recognize traffic signs and warn you, like, if you missed one, something like that. Or, I don't know, like, voice recognition in this uh, speaker that we just saw. So those are using ML for doing useful work and not just for security. And actually, to build those, you need uh, a lot of expertise, time, money. You need data sets. Uh, That costs a lot. And then once you've created it, it's you have like a machine learning model inside of your device and you need to be sure that your competitor will not steal it or that uh, some hacky guy, you know, in a basement will not create a special input which hacks your device just because the machine learning input is not processed correctly. Uh, those are those are called adversarial examples. I, I bet you know those. Um, so securing machine learning processing against attacks this is a like a super complicated challenge because uh, like side channel attacks, you can use them on crypto. You can use them against uh, models, um, right? Uh, same for, yeah, all these adversarial examples. Like it, it's kind of a, you know, hacky input for your ML to produce an inaccurate result. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Nikita. Guillaume has an interesting quote here. I mean, interesting thought that he shared with me is, and I'll just read it because I don't want to change it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we all remember the paper by uh, KTH. Uh, this is the Rowe Institute that um, claimed to have broken Crystal's cyber implementation with deep learning. And most journal- journalists saw this as a weakness of the algorithm. I saw it as a weakness of the implementation of the algorithm. With a weak implementation, any algorithm can be broken, whether it's PQC or not. And this is lead us to the next topic, but we will stay here for a while. It's about post-quantum cryptography. I just wanted to give an example where machine learning can be applied to analytics, can be applied to attacks. Um, so just back to you, I just wanted to add this quote from Guillaume. Oh, yeah, thank you. So yes, indeed, uh, machine learning will be used more for, for attacks. And I bet that was side channel attack. Yeah. I, I didn't read this particular paper, but probably it was a side channel attack using some machine learning against an implementation of Kyber Dilithium, right? Uh, I can try crystals. to show it on the on the okay. screen in a bit. Uh, so a yeah, but but both of these big domains, so machine learning for security and security for machine learning, they will probably be very very interesting in upcoming years. I agree. So I think um, Dimitri, back to your question about uh, is machine learning going to help with the security of these trusted elements and trust root of trust and all. I think uh, if we use it in the design and implementation, to your point about the difference between the algorithm versus implementation, I think it has a very good role in making sure that the, it's a clean and secure implementation. Right? So at design time, making sure that all the different scenarios are uh, vetted against the you know the, uh, the implementation, and making sure that uh, there are no you know low hanging fruit vulnerabilities or at least AI powered attacks are going to be you know. Um, rooted out of the implementation, I think there's a lot of different promise we could apply there. The other way around, being able to use, um, you know, these technologies for protecting machine learning models and all, I think there is also a model protection and the data protection oriented use cases. I think these security technologies do have a big role in it. We are, at Intel, we call it confidential AI, right? So how do we make sure that, uh, content that is being ingested into the training or into the inference uh, pipelines are protected in a particular way using cryptographically assured implementations is a key opportunity area for research and develop product development. 
So we are certainly looking at that as well. The, that's a that's a good trend. Confidential computing, confidential computer architecture by ARM also, mm-hmm. right? Um, and th- that brings an interesting question about again the not so much about cost but also resources. A lot of these technologies are not applicable or have not been applicable until lately. For example, Trust Zone M is something that we have for a couple of years now. And by the way, I'll be very interested to talk to people after the panel that are using or trying to use Trust Zone M. Uh, come, come to me after the panel. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, so, conventional compute at some point, I, I don't, I'm not sure we can run it at the edge where is the smart sensor, right? Which is uh, a real use case we had with one of the largest check banks. Um, they have so many offices with so many smart sensing, making energy cost efficient offices and whatnot. So their worry is, okay, the technician comes, tampers the sensor, and now instead of cost savings, we have cost surge. And of course, this will happen maybe once or twice, maybe for two months, but still that's a real concern. So when you look at solutions to secure Cortex M0 based devices, there's almost anything, like nothing you can, you can actually take. So, okay, now we have M3, M4, more affordable still. There's no trust zone. You need to put additional uh, external IC, uh, hardware secure module. It gets expensive. So actually, to be fair, um, when you choose a particular core, ARM core, or a particular device, you need, and you take security into account, you also need to take into account like the level of security that you want, right? The, the type of attacker that you care about, the type of system that you have. How expensive do you want to make it yeah, for yeah, the attacker? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, like if your uh, security and uh, if your device, if the stuff that you're protecting mm-hmm. is not costing a lot, let's say it costs $3, mm-hmm. uh, why would you spend like millions on security, you know? If it's a, uh, quickly replaceable if it costs almost nothing and you need just something quick against uh, attacks which take less than a minute you know and that's you know Un- uh, unless unless it's in a network where this becomes like an island hopping capability where you're indeed. able to use this device as a way to onboard yourself as an attacker into the system and then go after some more lucrative targets yeah, yeah absolutely right? correct and, but and this I, is in the attacker model that's right. right and i think this is one one network that we underestimate is the home network because that's an, once you get one home, you can get the rest in the buildings mm-hmm. jumping through, uh, the rest department in the buildings or offices or whatever. And what I think is happening now, we saw a ton of regulation in the past two, three years about IoT security and whatnot, right? Critical infrastructure. And suddenly now we have these qualified schemes where, uh, you kind of, it, it's a label, right? In the US, they will have that label. We have the same happen in the EU recently. So essentially your device qualifies for a uh, good advanced and, and whatnot security label. And this is to inform the user that's purchasing the device. It might be the exact same vendor or different vendors. The one will say, hey, I'm uh, self-certified that I have good security and the other, the other has advanced security. So now the user or the, the home user, the family can choose, okay, we'll pay a bit more for this more secure router or this more secure smart TV. So, Right. And, and I think that's where the, the, the change will happen is it will be in the mindset that, um, it will not be so much that technology itself will, hey, everything will be secure. Everything will have trust zone name. It will have, uh, TPM or edge lock or, uh, Apple, uh, T2 chip will be in smart devices suddenly in five to 10 years. Right. That's, that's highly unlikely, but it will be actually the users being informed. Okay. This has just like basic level security, I'll opt for the more one and I'll pay more. And when customers start paying more, then um, this will be an incentive to invest more. And I want to jump to the next topic unless you have some comments extra. No, I I just wanted to say uh, when it comes to consumers, making it consumable in that way with star systems and all is certainly the way to go. And I'm happy to see that the IoT industry is going in that space right now. Um, you know, we're so used to seeing Energy Star in the U.S. for power efficiencies and all. So similar things that needs to happen for security. And I do see a day where, you know, privacy conscious and security conscious consumers will start to say, well, I, I probably don't need a two star. I need a three star or a exactly. four star. I had to and purchase then, a washing machine the other day right. for my mother-in-law because mm-hmm. it broke down. And actually, this was one of the things we looked. We just went there and we saw, okay, this washing machine is more energy efficient. Correct. And believe it or not, this is one of the most consuming uh, thing you can have in your home 
electricity wise right so, yeah now though i think uh, that's the way to go and i'm happy to see that the industry is actually headed that way mm-hmm. and that will make sure that there is a mi- minimum viable feature set for security at each star level as well what what co- what's coming next and i didn't plan for this topic but it emerges uh, is that actually regulations and guidelines these labeling system will clash mm-hmm. the regulation will say that you need 10 set of features or uh, security measures and the labeling will say okay actually if you have five you can put a label it's good but then the regulation says okay but if it's only five you're not even allowed to sell it uh, so we, we went uh, like backwards first regulation then gui- guidelines and of course there was an ESA guidelines for IoT like maybe five seven years now but they were very broad and there was no labeling system mm-hmm. so it will be an interesting time where I think probably some regulation will be reversed a bit yeah. and then we just uh, empower the end customer or the system owners, right? Uh, who purchase the system like the bank in the Czech Republic that purchases do- dozens of smart sensing devices, smart metering en- energy metering and whatnot. So, moving forward, IoT and Edge, post-quantum compute, uh, post-quantum, not computing, post-quantum uh, cryptography. Crypto. Yeah. Again, we are limited by resources, right? Not every device can do that. Guillaume here, and I remember that by heart, uh, said that, okay, post-quantum cryptography, there's a lot going on there. We don't know if it will happen in five or ten years, but it's good to have a PQC strategy. And I think he's right about that. Uh, the other thing he says about usability is, okay, you can apply digital signatures even, even today, right? That works. Uh, that's what uh, Key Factor recently added as a support. And I think that's probably one thing where he's very right. Uh, not everything is figured out on the PKI, how you can use X509 with the, with the PQC. He mentioned something about Diffie Helfman, and I just wish he was here so he can elaborate. He mentioned something about the Diffie Helfman being uh, broken when you try to do uh, X509 with a, with a um, PQC and so on. Uh, the, the Cerberus uh, algorithm was it. I just have to look for it. I wish he was here. But the point being that... Um, it's part of, it's, it's like a, something of a hype about the, and, and it's about usability, right? People keep hearing about it. And they're like, okay, my algorithm, my device, my security, my system will be broken when post quantum computing happens. And then it doesn't happen one year, five years, you know? So when it will happen and where we are on the curve of, of hype, like first we were very scared, peak of inflated expectations. Now we're like, okay, maybe it will be another decade or two. And are we already in the slope of alignment where we'll see actually, uh, you know, solutions applicable, easy to access? So I can tell you for sure that, uh, so there are two things which are separate, you know, post-quantum cryptography coming up and a quantum computer coming up. So those are, those are separate. Quantum computer, nobody knows, right? For sure, nobody knows. Uh, we have some, they are small for now. They can do some very tiny computations, right? But it's progressing. And I think IBM has like a very strict, uh, you know, like a time schedule for making bigger and bigger ones. Uh, and then post-quantum crypto, this is definitely coming. Like there is no doubt about that. The standardization process is started. And I think the standard is arriving next year. There are already two finalists from a competition. So there was a crypto competition which finished uh, uh, a little bit earlier. And now there are two uh, algorithms which which are arriving and there are some more as like a backup solutions because this is a kind of a new domain. So a lot of people are not 100% sure about like how it works and uh, whether it's secure enough. I mean, we are quite sure uh, <laughs> after the competition, right? And but what kind of uh, was scary, I don't know if you, you followed it, uh, but just after the announcement of uh, the two finalists for signatures and key encapsulation mechanisms, uh, someone just broke one of the uh, algorithms, uh, which was actually one of the, uh, sub- like, uh, let's say, top runners. And I want to ask you here, how would you respond to someone who says, this is too early for production, I want to see it mature? Uh, on one hand, we have... Uh, Guillaume, for example, saying, hey, you need to have a PQC strategy because we know the algorithms that we're using today, mass use, are not resistant to that. That's correct. But at the same time, we have a solution that's too early that we don't know if it's actually going to work. So, because I see you, you have your personal interest in that field. So, please share. Um, it depends what 
you mean when you say might not work? That can mean many, many different things. So one of them is like PQC is slow compared to, to what we are used to do and to have, you know, and it has bigger keys compared to what we use now, right? Well, and that, that might be not fitting in some devices that you really, really want to fit it in, right? Or it means just for these devices, you need to pay more because, well, you kind of have to. There is no way around uh, storing less bits. And we're coming back to the cost, which yes. is fun. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. And unfortunately, uh, it's a cost which will have to happen. And uh, uh, the other thing is that, well, um, we don't know when, post -qu when quantum computers are coming. Likely, they, they will be developed. They're big enough ones to break our modern crypto. Um, but there is this attack where, which is kind of uh, a problem in some domains, which is called store now, decrypt later. So if you would start storing the entire traffic coming to some specific websites or some services, and then just wait for a quantum computer to arrive, and then 10 years later you decrypt everything, uh, that might be a problem. For example, the, like the most simple example is, of course, kind of political. If you have a totalitarian state, you know, okay. uh, which wants to, well, find uh, people who are not aligned with the mm -hmm. regime, mm -hmm. uh, they might say, okay, we're going to just start recording the entire internet traffic outgoing from some places. Hoping that one day they'll break it. And then in 10 years, we'll check what they were talking about. Right. You know, this is like a scary it kind is. of scenario. In it some is. Cases. And, and so, yeah, I mean, for politics, that's an issue, but it, just any PIIs, right? Personally, any dating address. Yeah. Uh, record now, decrypt later is the biggest concern that we're worried about as well. So, this is why, uh, Dimitri, we are closely tracking the implementations for PQC at the moment to see which ones are likely to be sort of the winning ones. And we're so ready to be able to incorporate that into the products. Uh, where the cost constraint is not the biggest one, but security is a bigger concern. And if the lifetime of those products are intended to be 10, 15 years out, um, you know, uh, and if quantum computers are likely uh, in that horizon, then these devices are going to be there, um, you know, in the deployed environment. So we're really looking forward to be able to uh, intercept the winning PQC uh, algorithms and implement them as well. Uh, but yeah, so I think um, this is a challenge that we'll have to grapple with in the decade, next decade. Yes. I can give you even one super concrete example, uh, like car manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, you start producing a car today, it takes maybe five years to develop About it. About so, yeah. Then you put it on the market, and it's going to be on the market for 25 next years yeah. or so. And uh, yeah, uh, and I see now we don't have a lot of time. Maybe we should give a yeah. people... I, I was going to say that I just wanted to to because we have we ha I have a set of uh, new solutions, and as I mentioned, this panel the idea was to talk mostly about what does not work and our thoughts about hey, but there are these alternatives, right? There are these new solutions. There here are our thoughts, and we want to include you now. Uh, but just before that, about the cars, because Nikita shared with with me and Guillaume when we were preparing for the panel initially that the new S32 uh, SOC by NXP has a PQC built in for some algorithms, right? It it supports uh, some uh, acceleration of that. It does, yes. So, but uh, in simple words, uh, um, some uh, post quantum uh, crypto algorithms require lots and lots of hashing. Mm. And so, if you have a very nice crypto accelerator for hashing, it will speed up the PQC. Mm. But the standard is not out yet. I mean, right. we, we kind of know the winners, right? We, we know the finalists, but we don't know all the kind of parameters. The details, yeah. yeah. And my, my, why I'm saying this is that now listening to you about the future, right? Data trace. It might be, uh, you know, at risk in the future and so on. I just thought to myself, okay, so this means that actually the first devices in production, mass production, that people will be using with uh, post-quantum cryptography will be actually cars because it's already there. Very and likely, yes. And, 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 and so these will be the devices that will be like the beta users. They, they will be the ones that will be exposed. That the incentives to break an algorithm or to find a side channel or whatever would be actually that you would gain control maybe, maybe over a fleet and not because the, uh, maybe it's not the implementation, right? Maybe it's something even more inherent, but it could be also the implementation. So I just thought of this right now. So that's very interesting. Like I would expect that it would be something more in the industrial realm, right? But at the same time, cars are already being built with smart systems that support post-quantum cryptography. 
No, I think cars certainly is uh, one primary target for, you know, PQC-based attacks and so on. But there are others, right? I mean, with this record now, decrypt later, you know, any infrastructure that actually is tracking or traffic, you know, t- dealing with traffic that's coming with PII information flowing through it, I think is also a target, so a potential target. So we need to be able to deal with implementations in those systems as well. I think the mitigation is, in in a sense, um, just just producing smaller quantities. Like even even with the supercar manufacturer that I spoke at the beginning, mm-hmm. I don't know, like. There are many reasons why they, they, they got stuck to the TPM 1.2 and why they, it took them so long to migrate to 2.0. But, um, I, I think that, uh, the more expensive cars will get this protection sooner. They're produced in less quantities. With this one, we were talking about 10,000 units, so it's not that much. So even if there's a risk, it will be hopefully somewhat mitigated, right? Or the newer models would get it first. So, uh, very exciting times. And, uh, now uh, I'll follow Nikita's advice recommendation and give the floor for questions. I've just marked a few topics. Let me know if something's interesting or you want to know more or you have a topic that we you want us to discuss, a question, or you want to share an experience. Because there are a lot of things that don't work and there are some solutions, as I mentioned, through Zone M, an interesting one, that we need to see more adoption of it. Not just being part of the silicon, but actually being used. Do we have questions uh, for all the topics that were discussed in the audience? Be brave. Don't be shy. Okay. If there's no one right now, then Nikita? maybe I can I can give you like a, a, another topic uh, which is interesting and it's kind of coming and it's gonna probably force a lot of companies to use more security. Uh, some regulations, especially in Europe, is coming up to kind of tell people that well, if you put a device on the market, it has to be updatable in the field, and you have to be able to update it. It's like a, a requirement. Otherwise, no, no selling, or especially no selling to some specific domains such as gas meters, electricity meters, and, and whatnot. Uh, medical, uh, you can name many others, I, I bet. And then uh, on top of it, you should be able to recover the device if it's ha- hacked. Uh, like this is a completely insane thing, right? Uh, like where do you put your trust at which point to be able to say, okay, I think I'm hacked. Now I need to reset. Um, like, how do we do that? And especially if these uh, infield systems are physically accessible and uh, physical security is a expectation at that point, right, to be able to protect against the hacks, none of these systems are actually set up to be able to do that intrinsically unless some inner purpose-built innovations are going to happen to be able to protect against those kind of attacks as well, right? So Indeed, and I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, actually, uh, for you, nice advice, uh, or if you have, like, children, I don't know, students coming up, uh, like, tell them to go to security because there will be a, a demand, I guess. Because uh, if a lot of companies which just used to produce some gadgets are now forced to have secure updates and recovery, uh, they will just have to hire security experts. Right. right now, I think the latest estimate that I saw was about three and a half million cybersecurity jobs hmm. that are out there. And uh, I agree with Nikita. So with these kind of regulatory expectations coming on, uh, the demand is going to be even higher at that point, and we simply don't have workforce to be able to support that. Today. It, it will take time to propagate, right? Yep. But it will grow over time, and uh, probably there will be some big winners, right? Service providers that will take part of it, so they will essentially automate and eliminate part of that. But again, there will be millions of jobs that yep. will be just waiting for uh, the right candidates. I think we have a question. Oh, yes, great. we have a question from here. Thank you for the discussion. Um, Cryptography, I think, creates another problem, key management. So you mentioned a car, and I think nowadays cars incorporate like hundreds of ECUs with unique keys. So one car has, let's say, 100 keys inside. That's correct, appropriately. Yeah, Yeah, it's roughly. Some of them probably more. So it's another problem. It's a key management. We can implement whatever cryptographic algorithm, super secure, how we manage the keys then. It's going to be stored somewhere in the secure environment and transferred over internet. Is it a good solution? Or we need to look in the multi-party computations? What are your comments? I think you're absolutely right. You've been point a problem which existed since like forever in Mm. cryptography. Regardless of the algorithms, uh, you know, like key management is just a hell of a problem to solve. 
I agree with you. I think uh, key management solutions and connectivity to cloud or edge is going to be a critical need there to be able to deal with the security of these keys. And revocation if needed, if things are compromised and being able to replace it and so on as well, right? So device level keys, per device, per fleet level keys, all of that needs some level of protection and management in field. And so key management systems is going to be a key innovation area to be able to propagate that. I agree with you. And uh, speaking of what you just mentioned, also multi-party multi combination is a very nice one. It's it's actually kind of, to me, it's almost magical as, uh, you know, a thing that we can do. It's like, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, maybe it's like you can compute on encrypted data. Usually we don't want anyone to be do, to be able to do anything on encrypted data, but we have like a, a bunch of special algorithms which allow to compute on encrypted data a nice result without knowing what the data is and what the result is. And only the final guy who, who can encrypt stuff can actually check the result. Right, so it's it seems like really magical to me. You're talking about homomorphic. Uh, it, it can be homomorphic, fully homomorphic. Uh, uh, okay. It's like a part of it, but multi-party computation you can trade uh, computational cost for communication cost. Mm. So you uh, you can go less compute intensive, but slightly more communication intensive. Uh, right. And uh, it's again, it's unfortunately kind of slow-ish, right, compared to just do normal computation, right? And so, again, security cost. I think um, encrypt everything for, for certain application areas, that becomes a very much of a requirement, right? Data in transit, data addressed, data in computation, uh, keeping it compu you know, encrypted at all times. Uh, for certain usage cases, that is a requirement. So, so there's a lot of innovation going on in being able to see what is the practicality of a fully homomorphic or partially homomorphic sort of applications as well. And uh, both hardware technologies and hardware slash firmware technologies, I think uh, there's quite a bit of innovation going on on that as well. Right, so these are interesting times on that regard. So we seem to have quite quite a few topics that are that need a better solutions. Key management being one, and I, I just want to give my take. Um, so uh, if I if I've learned something about industrial systems, because this is my background, um, is that uh, we can simplify. So if I have thousand keys, I'll try to reduce them by a factor, right, of ten. By how? What? Well. I'll, I'll try to make some smart system not smart. I don't know, electromechanical or, or just, uh, just an analog to digital converter that gives me the data and the main ECU consumes it, right? I'll give more, more crunching to the ECU, but I'll skip some keys and I'll just have a built in encrypted communication of somehow, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, mitigate that. On the other hand, this brings us back to security and cost, right? The trade-off. For example, the TPM, the 2.0 TPM, yeah, uh, quite very tamper resistant. Uh, but at the same time, you have only three slots, key slots that you can use at all times. So you have to, you, um, save the key externally. Of course, it's encrypted. Of course, only the TPM can encrypt it with an internal key because it's wrapped in it. And that key was generated inside the TPM and so on and so on. But at the same time, this is a limitation. You have to constantly swap keys. So Linux, for example, have this um, key manager, right, that, that does that, but that lives in the kernel space, some part of it in the user space. Okay, more problems. So key management is a problem. And if you want to have it secure, three key slots. And you need to pull in, pull out all the time. You need to load, unload keys. So simplify or, uh, yeah, try to have, this kind of solution where you limit your hierarchies somehow. So it's not ideal, but it's a trade-off. Computing power, so you do more or, uh, you know, use more innovative solutions. But again, it has a cost of performance. I think we have yet another question. Oh, okay. Yes, we do have yet another question. Yes, I had a question. Um, I heard uh, low-hanging fruit, but... There's enough fruit on the floor because nobody reads the specs of a chip manufacturer. <laughs> Can we please fix this and then start with the lowering fruit? It's um, not that hard, I think. I, if you read I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, so more vendors, including like uh, Scilabs, NXP with the edge lock, what they're trying to do, as I mentioned, they're trying to do the Apple experience. So essentially they're saying, hey, you don't need to learn everything about security. We give you a security solution. Here's the API. Here's our cloud system. Edge lock comes with a cloud management system for provisioning and so on. Right? Just, just here's that if you want it. It costs a bit more, but... You know, we, we've cut like 50% of the work for you if you want it. So again, this requires that you trust more the vendor. And as long as you're happy with that, you can do it. 
Uh, and I think we'll see more of that. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I, I hate reading manuals as well. And I think, uh, you know, uh, we are basically looking at the last days of uh, what used to be the traditional manuals in the, in the future, right? So I think generative AI, generative AI-based applications um, and manuals is going to be the thing as well. In fact, I was just a couple of days ago talking to some auto manufacturers uh, if you look at how they're using generative AI, if it's, it's in the mode of uh, replacing manuals. So the user would have natural language questions being asked of the vehicle. And, you know, the manual level details would be provided in a consumable way. Uh, voice and visual recognition and videos and things like that. Generative, generative AI applications. That's the future of the manuals going um, I, I, Before giving the word to Nikita for, for final words, I want to comment on that. That um, Here comes an interesting question about system ownership. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, evolved around the use of hardware security modules, uh, first by banks, then by uh, uh, even um, Microsoft with the Xbox, right? I had to figure out a way for um, essentially moot user ownership. And that's another uh, aspect that uh, you need to worry not only about recovering a hacked device, but uh, making, wiping a device in a way that it can go on a second, on the, on the second market. So someone can buy your second hand uh, smart car. So uh, system ownership, why, why I mentioned that before giving the word to Nikita? Because this is uh, then the next problem. When you eliminate the knowledge barrier and you remove the manuals, which give away, in a sense, the control, but it makes it easier, it makes it more accessible, then even developers will not be able to own the security of the system, right? They, they need to depend on the vendor saying, if you do this API, we generate a key, only the key lives only on the platform and so on. And... Um, then trust our cloud provisioning system that is built in ready to use, you know, it cuts time, it cuts cost, and that's amazing. But just, um, I think the next challenge will be for silicon vendors, MCU vendors, SOC, and so on, to also be able to provide the ability that we now have with uh, Windows machines, with the TPM functionality, the, the ability that we have with Apple machines, with MacBooks, with built-in T2 chips and, 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 and solutions that essentially they allow you to wipe all your data, have a system, flashed as if it was new, but the laptop is not new, and then have trust into your system, put your data there, your work there. So this challenge will is just starting to come to the uh, silicon vendors because they're making it easier by taking more responsibility, but they'll start to have to figure out, okay, what about system ownership and user ownership and also vendor ownership, right? Because we have OEM uh, vendors that you would see smart sensor, it's one vendor, actual manufacturer, just different label on the top, different man, uh, PKI systems and so on. Nikita, to you for final words. Uh, okay, thank you for the question about uh, fruit on the floor. <laughs> Indeed, there is plenty, and uh, I think there are two parts. Uh, first of all, the domain dependent. In some domains, uh, the security is kind of by default slightly better because it's more regulated and there are requirements, right? Uh, hopefully, at least. Uh, and in some domains, it's at least uh, wild, wild west, right? Uh, but uh, manuals, it's uh, its also uh, an issue for the very simple reason, like writing a good manual is hard, like seriously. If you've tried ever, like, yeah, um, it's difficult. And then uh, reading a manual, like nobody wants to do that uh, because people are kind of at least a little bit lazy. And then uh, finding a problem based on a manual, like you need to read it, but you also need to understand it, which is even worse, right? Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's a serious, serious problem, I think. Let's give a thank you to both Dinesh and Nikita, and thank you for participating.